and welcome to episode 110 of the Crate and Crowbar podcast, the only PC gaming podcast which is a threat to national security, <laughs> economic security, and your family's security. <laughs> it is the 15th of September, and I am Chairman Marsh Davis, joined by the Red Peril, which is the two Tomskis, <laughs> Tom Francis, hello, and Tom Senior. Hello, comrade. <laughs> Gentlemen, although obviously uh, all gaming news this week has been dwarfed by the country's increasing hysteria about the Labour leadership election, there has been some exciting PC gaming news only today. In fact, 28 minutes ago, what happened, Tom Senior? There was a blinding flash of light <laughs> and a new uh, gaming channel was launched on PCGamer.com, which is called PC... Gamer uh, Pro. <laughs> <laughs> Did you literally say it in a great grove of voice? <laughs> yeah, it's a piece of Gamer Pro. And uh, it's dedicated to um, awesome... Chris Thurston. Chris Thurston is in charge. Awesome Chris uh, is it dedicated entirely to Chris? Yeah. No, uh, in his memory. It, it, he's, uh, he's, he's running it all. And uh, his passion for esports and the surrounding culture of esports will be expressed. Mm. A series of exciting articles which hopefully will be friendly to people who aren't mega into the intricacies of and the complexities of those esports. Though there will be coverage that exists at that depth. I think a lot of it is going to be about explaining to people why these games are so awesome to watch yeah. and why they're kind of... It's so it's so much fun to actually view these things as sports and to, you know, enjoy the phenomenon of a tournament and all the exciting stuff that is kind of... People can be a bit dismissive about, but actually we believe is a really cool thing to be involved in. I think people, people dismiss it because it's, it's impenetrable mm. uh, and hopefully the site... Will make it penetrable. That is definitely one of, one of its aims. He's going to perforate that thing all over the place. <laughs> Absolutely. Make it Wherever entirely porous. Yeah. Like a colander. So uh, check it out. It's uh, pcegamer.com forward slash pro, mm-hmm. I believe. And uh, there's going to be loads of stuff on there. League of Legends, Dota 2, lots of lots of hot stuff. You should write about hot for us, Mosh. Could do. Your, your pro strats. Need to uh, need public. You know, I don't think I'm, I'm pro enough for it. Yeah. I, I, I was thinking I, I'm, I was tempted by the idea of writing a column called uh, Scrublander, <laughs> <laughs> uh, where I detail. Well, the thing is, uh, yeah, I, I was going to talk about Hots this episode. You you have more exciting things to talk about, both of you. But should I, since this is an opportunity to segue straight into Hots? Yeah, should let's, I do? let's go for it. Well, the thing about Hots, right? <laughs> The thing about HOTS, the thing I like about HOTS, is that it promises to be kind of more appealing to people who are basically shit um, at these mm. sort of games. And, well, not necessarily shit, but, like, just don't have the many, many hours to burn that uh, I think it takes to, to form a kind of, like, appreciation of Dota, maybe. Mm. And so it's it's perhaps a slightly simpler game. I think it does have kind of complexities and depth to it and a richness that can be appreciated, but it's just it's just more accessible, you know, and that's mm. that's a good thing. And uh, although I can, I can watch, like, pro matches of, of HOTS and be entertained by them and see strats that I can halfway recognise, which is impossible to me in most other esports, mm. um, I th- my main enjoyment of it is, is playing it. But at the same time, I have an appreciation for it, which is... More than just knocking around, like, I want to play the game at a level where the people I'm playing with have a, not, not like super serious, but like, want to win matches and want to apply the strategies that are possible in the game to do so. Mm. You know, without, without trying to, you know, spend a hundred hours and looking up loads and loads of pages on wikis to just to kind of, to be obsessive about winning. Mm. Like, I, I want to have a good time, but I also want to engage with the game sort of like, I care mm. about it. It's not just a, uh, you know, a five-side, you know, skins footy match done down in the park while everybody's drinking cider. Hmm. It's got to be, you know, something reasonably robust. Uh, but I, f- I fear for that that territory because I think I think there's there's inevitable pressure for any of these kind of games to eventually form like a pro scene and to encourage players to move towards that. And I think the longevity of these games comes from kind of just building on complexity hmm. in- infinitely. Um, and I think that kind of threatens the sort of... S- I'm not quite sure what you'd call it. It's not a casual. It's not exactly hardcore. It's just, uh, you know... Hmm. Do you think it has to increase in complexity? Because, like, like, looking at, I suppose... The MOBA, I mean, particularly, really. Yeah, I, mean, I, mean, I think about what Blizzard have done with oh. StarCraft 2. Uh, I guess with expansions, they, they're adding new units... Um, so, like, in the sort of numeric sense it does. I think they've taken some away as well. Um, but probably overall it is a bit more complicated. But from listening to, like, how Chris talks about Dota 2, it 
doesn't sound like the game sort of... I suppose it is getting more complicated because they keep adding more champions. Mm. But in terms of the mechanics, it, it sounded to me like a thing that keeps it fresh is that they keep rebalancing. So things that were already in there are now just different. This thing is no longer any good, and this thing suddenly is very good, mm. kind of stuff. Which it seems like you could do that without any, adding complexity. Yeah, I guess so. You could just constantly change it, um, change the meta. But I suppose that's, that is a kind of complexity in itself, forcing people to keep track of yeah, where, where the meta is at any single point. And then you've got games like Counter Strike that just exist in stasis, mm, and the slightest yeah. change infuriates people <laughs> who played it all that time. Yeah, yeah. Um, but at the moment, this, it, Hots is going through this interesting period where mm. it's kind of matured now as a kind of released game. Mm. And, we're still waiting to see what kind of game it's turning into. You know, what 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 the 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 patches, subsequent patches, what they set a precedent for in terms of the kind of destiny that that game has. And um, I was complaining a few uh, podcasts ago about all the new heroes being OP, um, which is a kind of because you buy heroes in Heroes of the Storm, possibly with real money. There is. You know, I'm not saying this is this is definitely Blizzard's strategy, but there is obviously an incentive for them. To, to make those heroes powerful while they're at their most expensive. And of course, they get discounted over time. But during the first few weeks, it makes sense that you want to make your, this, this expensive product as appealing as possible to people. And, you know, the community is very watchful about whether Blizzard is doing that. And obviously, the community would react negatively and has reacted negatively on certain occasions. I don't think all the heroes they've released have been overpowered. Um, but there were there were a, a string of ones which were certainly overpowered, and Leoric, who's this character who is a, a, some kind of fucking ghost king who can't die, um, <laughs> is just fucking ridiculous. Like he's meant to be a tank, but he he has massive damage, um, <laughs> and he can't die, <laughs> which is which is kind plus. of yeah. I mean, he kind of he's reduced from usefulness. He goes into this spectral phase when you deplete his health bar, and the team gets XP for for putting him in that state. But eventually he just spawns back where he was and he can do annoying things while he's in his spectral phase. And, uh, yeah, I, I, as it happens, I'm not always, uh, I'm not, I'm not certainly not on the level where I can necessarily say whether a hero is overpowered across the board, only at the level at which I play. And so the community often has different ideas about who's mm. overpowered than I do because, you know, the pro teams might weigh in and say this hero is overpowered. But this overpowered because he's doing things that I can't do. Yeah. Um, but it seems to be the consensus that Leoric is a, a hot load of bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, even, it sounds like he, he is in this case, but mm. it, it, I mean, is the perception of heroes being OP whenever they're released is, is as damaging. It's just, yeah, yeah. It just it damages your faith in the entire uh, you know, integrity of the, the balance of the game. That's where monetization systems can directly impact mm. on the, like the the quality of the game. Like there's, there's, if I'm going to get into a big, massive time sync game, I want to know two things. One, is it actually going to last for a long time? Yeah. Is all the, all, are all these hours just going to be wasted? And secondly, what's the monetization system? And how does that, you know, affect the ways that the designers will introduce new mechanics and new ideas? And yeah. It's like the paying for heroes thing. I mean, LOL is, is huge. And obviously that has mm. a similar model, but, uh, to me, it's just inherently, it poisons me. Yeah. I, I wouldn't get into it because that's a, such a huge money sink, uh, and I would be conscious, constantly anxious about the fact that I don't own heroes that are essential to to a meta. Yeah, I, I kind of um, it's odd. I mean, I, I don't really. It's uh, again like a this is comes from me being a scrub, but like I haven't. I've bought Leoric, but I kind of don't really want to play him because. Mm. Uh, and it's not that I feel like it's cheating to play as Leoric, but I'm always kind of fucked off when I see him on the enemy team. I'm like, <laughs> oh, well, that's why you killed me. You know, it's just, it's, you're, you're just better. You're better with maths. Um, and uh, so, I, you know, I don't know. But I, I, I kind of think that on the whole, they've they've done due diligence on those heroes in trying to make mm. them uh, n- not not woefully overpowered. And uh, the, the kind of at the horror of Heroes of the Storm... Um, do I need to explain what a MOBA is, really, <laughs> to our audience? Mm, probably not. Lane pushing game. We yeah. have kind of AI minions which are in equilibrium and the two teams uh, duke it out with actual kind of individual heroes which affect the equilibrium that's going on on the map. Mm. Um, but Heroes of the Storm is different because whereas Dota has only one map, 
here is the song has a large number of different ones which are slightly different or slightly differently organized and have gimmicks on them so there's one level where you you collect coins from certain areas of the map then you pay to a, 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 a ghostly sea pirate and he bombards the enemy's forts with cannon fire for you and um the, they've released new their idea is they're continuously releasing new gimmicky maps and um some of them have been good uh, and some of them i think pretty terrible um of the last two, they've both been Diablo themed. One was called mm. Battle of Battlefield of Eternity, which I uh, I don't know if it's a terrible map, but I really hate it. Um, <laughs> uh, it's, it's very, and I think it's possibly because again, at the level I'm playing at, there's just no uh, the the teams that I'm playing with at my level can't articulate any kind of strategy that's successful on that map. It has lots of um, very small bits of kind of obstructions all over the battlefield, which means that you constantly, you can't form like a defensive line. Like, in these games, you, you have different classes of characters. Obviously, you want to put your tanks at the front, then you want to put your kind of glass cannons flitting back and forward, you know, throwing things over the top, and then you want to have your support units, your, your healers kind of out of the line of fire, usually, unless mm-hmm. they have some kind of joint role. But here, because the, the way that combat flows around these boulders and rocks in the center of the map, means you're always kind of just fragmenting your team and pushing people out of position. And I think it's quite satisfying if you play like a, a character that can solo easily, like some of the kind of more robust assassins uh, or, or, um, or or certain tanks. But if you're like in a support role, it's a fuck because you've just got, you know, your team's just you know, pissing off basically and they're always out of range and you know, it's really easy for people to pick you off if you're, if you're a glass cannon and stuff. And uh, uh, that's... I find it extremely frustrating to play on. I don't, even when I win, I don't feel I've done it because I've, mm. we've, we've been successful in any kind of intellectual way. And, uh, that's been followed up by a much better map, or at least it's kind of more, more simple <laughs> for, for people like me, um, where, uh, you go to certain points, you fight a bunch of minions, and then depending on how many minions you kill on these locations, you summon these mega demons to come and fight for you, and these these demons come in different flavors, randomly selected, and they just plow down the lanes. And and uh, b- but instead of just knocking down forts and defenses, they go after heroes. Mm. Um, and it's very easy to kind of uh, create a snowballing effect by that for using that. I think it's one of the only maps where it's much harder to come back from a, a losing position, mm. like most of the other other maps, um, even. You, you fight until, you know, you, even if you're five levels below the other team, you can usually come back from a, come back from that if you, uh, have a really kind of persuasive team fight or something mm. like that. Um. At the level you're playing, do mm. you, how do you choose who you play as? Is it like everyone just picks freely or do you have a captain who tells you who to play or? I'm glad you asked that because that brings me on to one of the latest changes with the latest patch. So there's two ways of, um, well, there's three ways of playing HOTS. You either play unranked, which means that you um, you can just uh, go into a lobby with as many f- or as few friends as you like. You pick whichever heroes you like, um, as long as you're not picking the same heroes yeah. as your friends. And then it, it just matchmates you with randoms, and you can drop in. Uh, uh, it doesn't matter who you're being matched against or, or, or really what composition team you have. You can even play against heroes who are the same hero as you. Huh. So you can have mirror teams. Which I think is what makes hot rubbish. I mean, that, that's, that's like, <laughs> like, no, no, like, or any, any, any MOBA is kind of about the asymmetry of those characters. Right. And being able to build up team compositions which have interlocking, interlocking tactics. That is what is fundamentally fascinating about that. So I don't, this is a quick aside, but on Dota, I never even understood whether there's a dire side and a radiant side, and mm. I've also seen the heroes categorised as dire or radiant. Does that mean you can only play as the dire heroes on if you're on the dire side? No, I don't believe so. No, you can pick any hero for any side. So yeah. what the fuck does that mean? <laughs> <laughs> That's I, weird. I think it's it? a, just a kind of weird division of law and. Yeah. It's like having a Team Fortress okay. Two team where you have a red and a blue team, and then like Sniper is the blue hero. <laughs> yeah. Spy is a red hero, but also you can still pick them if you're on blue. Mm. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, it is weird, but then, you know, Dota is awful, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> it must be its Warcraft roots, I think, because they must have been Horde and Alliance, or... Uh, no, because they're always mm. dire radiant, weren't they? There's, that's, there that's is lore behind each of the characters, and there, there are, like, there is the right relationships between them and stuff. It's weird that you'd write that lore for a game that contradicts that lore. <laughs> yeah, yeah that, that's one of the many odd things about that. <laughs> uh, but but the, the kind of... Uh, the more serious level of play 
the is is Hero League where you get to pick and ban opponents mm. when you when you play a game. So you join the lobby, nobody's selected any characters at this point. Then one team gets to pick one character, the next team gets to pick two, next team gets to pick two Seem I've forgotten how many characters we've already listed. <laughs> but anyway, no, you carry carry on until you've finished. Um but that's that's what is that seems to me to be the the kind of fundamental part of those games, what is so fascinating about them. And it's really exciting as as the picks and bans are being made to kind of you know, work out what kind of strategy you're going to have and try desperately to persuade your usually Russian speaking teammates <laughs> that's what you need to do. And um that doesn't always work. But with the latest change to this, there's also another mode where you play as uh, teams, teams of uh, five. So you, you you have to you can't join uh, with a team of two, for example. The team play matchmaking system only accepts five people in a right. single lobby. But anyway, the latest the latest uh, latest patch changes this so that you can only play Hero League, which is the pick and ban version, if you have. Uh, if you're queuing with only one or two people in a team, which means that if you're a, if you're in a group of three, you have to uh, you have to play uh, casual. You have to play the, the random matchmaking. If you're a team of four, you have to do that. And Blizzard have kind of said that this is this is the case because they didn't want to make the game worse for solo players who might not who might feel excluded from like team strategy if they're the only solo player. <laughs> Or, or they want to play with other solo players, teams entirely made out of other other solo players. And they say that the number of people who are queuing as threes or fours is is so negligible to to make this an acceptable change. But like, uh, that's personally annoying to me because I most frequently queue as threes or fours, and uh, I don't anticipate ever getting five people together who are of a sufficient rank that we can play the team matchmaking mode. It also means that if you play as two people in Hero League, uh, what we what we often did, me and Richard, when we were playing it, is that we play a few games, we find other people that we like playing with um, from the random matchmaking, we invite them to the team. You can't do that, because unless you successfully snatch enough players to fulfill, you know, to fill up an entire team, you're going to be booted back to the, the yeah. crapo version of the game. And even if you're playing solo, then if you meet someone cool you're like playing with, you can't play with that person because you need three others. <laughs> hmm. Well, it does allow you to play as twos in, in Hero League. Oh, okay. Which is slightly confusing. But also, the other thing is, I know that the HOTS is a game for, um, you know, it's, it, I'm happy for people to play HOTS solo. Obviously, people would do enjoy playing it solo. Uh, and they should not be stopped. But uh, at, the, at the same time, it is it is a team game, and like all the strategies that are, are in it, are uh, benefit or, or rely upon cooperation and coordination. So it seems strange to me that the designers are incentivizing people to play either in solo or in this slightly unrealistic version of the world where people can regularly just grab five people together to play Hero League. Mm. It does seem arbitrary. Like, if you're going to allow teams of two, why wouldn't you allow teams of three? Because the two we're going to be playing with. <laughs> At some point, there's going to be three other players in there. Yeah. I like the phrase, I'm not sure whether this, I heard this from you, Marsh, but the, the idea of blame space. No, I haven't heard that. No, I, 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 I saw Mr. said it, maybe it was Chris. But uh, the idea that uh, you're in a team of, say, three in Dota or four, even, and then there's the one final person and they have occupied the blame space. <laughs> uh, and it's their, uh, everything that happens that goes wrong is kind of their fault. And mm. the interesting thing about it is that it's really deeply unfair to that person. Oh, yeah. Who's just trying to play a game. And, and, uh, they're battling not only with the kind of the inability to communicate properly with these strangers, but also with their innate resentment for the fact that they have occupied this position of blame automatically for just being not part of the group. Yeah, I know that is a problem. And obviously these two, these changes do make it better for solo players, but I would have suggested that rather than do this, they should have made a, a separate solo play dedicated list. Mm. And I don't think that, you know, if I was a solo player, uh, I would necessarily want to play with other people who are only playing it solo. Mm. Like, again, it's a game that benefits from team strategy. I'm going to win more if I'm in a, in a group which has four players who are playing together and me, probably, than if I'm in a group of yep. four randoms, like none of whom are communicating or on, on Skype with each other or whatever. Mm. They should... Let you play as a team of four, and then give you a bot that joins, but they don't tell you it's a bot, they pretend it's another player, so you can always blame the bot, and no one's actually having that shitty experience of being blamed. <laughs> <laughs> it could just be like a... The blame bot. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> nice. 
Yeah, but uh, this is, I mean, this gets to the kind of the heart of what I was saying about being, uh, you know, living in the scrubland is that Blizzard have kind of nuked the the particular kind of space in which I occupy as a player of the their game. the scrubland. <laughs> the scrubland, yeah. Hmm. So I kind of have a, you know, I, presumably they want people to to kind of step up and get together in teams of five. Yeah. But I can't, I can't just do that, you know. Like, you know, I, of an evening, I can't just find three people, you know, five people on IM, on IM who are, who are ready yeah. and willing to play at the drop of a hat. I can do that with three people. We can do it with two, certainly. But are there any guild features in Hots? Not yet, no. Uh, you see, that's the kind of that's what allows things like WoW uh, historically to have raids that demand like twenty people is to mm-hmm. let people form these large groups of uh, you know these these people you can call on at a moment's notice yeah. to, uh, to play. And that's kind of what that's for, isn't it? Guilds reminds me of a similar problem with Destiny as well, where their highest level content requires you to form teams of six. And it's, it's the hardest stuff in the game when you get the best stuff for doing it, and it's some of their best designed stuff. But the the barrier to entry isn't really the gear grind; it's the ability to get five other people <laughs> together for two or three hours to yeah. do a thing, and that's it's really hard. <laughs> yeah. And uh, it, you know, it's all. Do you think if someone designed a MOBA that was teams of three, do you think mm. that that would be a, a better experience for people, just because you'd be more able to form teams, more able to get together? Yeah, possibly. I mean, I, I kind of, I kind of think they probably hit upon the right size in order to introduce the amount of dynamism that mm. those those games thrive on. But I mean, I'm sure you could design a game which would be three versus of three, which would work fine. Mm. Right. Yeah, anyway, you've been playing another Blizzard game, haven't you? Tom? I have. I've been back on the Diablo crack uh, <laughs> since they uh, their latest update, which added a new zone called the Ruins of Sesheron, and deep inside the Ruins of Sesheron, there's Kanai's Cube. <laughs> and, uh, and this is uh, Diablo 3's equivalent of Diablo's two, uh, Diablo 2's Heradric Cube, uh, yeah. which let you bung a load of stuff uh, into the cube and it press transmute and then it would turn all that stuff into other stuff. And there were l- like hundreds of hidden recipes and ways of doing things in Diablo 2. Mm. Uh, they simplified all that in Diablo 3, uh, but what it can do, uh, the things it can do are extremely useful. The best one being that if you've got a legendary item, the legendary items have these uh, brilliant, they're called affixes, these special powers that will, they could summon a minion uh, to follow you around. In fact, I've got one, uh, you know, an axe that summons a minion every few seconds until there's four of them. So there are constantly four little imps running around with me because I've got this this thing equipped. There's another one where every time I get a mask bonus, killing a lot of creatures, um, gold rains from the sky. <laughs> uh, and just batshit stuff like that happens all the time. If I, every ten enemies I hit, uh, a poison nova explodes out of me that deals <laughs> two thousand percent weapon damage to everyone in the radius. That just happens constantly now, uh, and that's just all, all. That's just a combination of all the. These are all weapon effects. They're not abilities tied to my character. It's just stuff I found and equipped. And what the cube lets you do is extract those abilities and put them onto your character directly, thus huh. enabling even greater range of like crisscrossing mega abilities for your ridiculously huh. powerful character. How many can you have? Uh, three. So you can extract one weapon one, uh, an armor one, I believe, and an amulet one or something, and uh, you can basically wear them <laughs> on your, like, in <laughs> your being, ability. inside you. Somehow. They used to have, in Diablo 2, they used to have, like, trinkets, which were hmm. items that had those abilities, but you didn't have to equip them. They were just in your, in your inventory, you get that ability. Hmm. Cool. Yeah, it's kind of similar, but they've, um, they've, they've, made it- they've turned itemization into a kind of extension of characterization. Where, you know, in these games traditionally you level up and then the act of leveling up unlocks innate skills inside your character that you can then execute on the battlefield. Mm. And Diablo 3 has moved half of that stuff out into the wilderness for you to find, which is really exciting for a game that is entirely about finding stuff and hitting stuff and, you know, picking up the ridiculous things mm. that fall out of them. And as a result, I kind of, I kind of think Diablo 3 is almost perfect <laughs> for, for its kind of mission statement and what the game it wants to be. I think it's pretty much there. I'm not, I don't know how it could be better, uh, except just to have more greater variety, more stuff in it. Uh, there's just to continue to expand it as a platform and just keep it, you know, adding expansions, new zones, crazy new affixes, bump the level cap up by 10 every couple of years. Do you know how many people are playing it now? No idea. Uh, 16. <laughs> <laughs> I'm playing it enough for many people. <laughs> so it's, it's back on it, and it's so it is horribly addictive, but and so much fun. Uh, so they've got these seasons where you can level a character from completely from scratch, 
And if you um, you get them up to 70 within a certain amount, like uh, a few months, then you get like extra pets and things like that. All right, so do they encourage you to start again? Yeah, so it's a way to encourage you to roll alts, basically. So right. I didn't have a hunter, so I rolled a hunter for season mode. <laughs> and I've just been obsessively leveling her up. And she's fucking amazing now. Like, <laughs> I only started it last week, and the, the, the progression is so fast uh, that... You, you just constantly unlock the ridiculous number of skills, and then you're constantly finding skills in the world as well, and just mashing them together into just... You, it's the best superhero simulator, really, for me, <laughs> because it's the, the higher difficulty levels, the number of creatures they throw at you, and the sheer kind of ludicrousness of the effects and the way that you can eliminate them is more... I feel more powerful in that game than most other games. Uh, and it's, it's absolutely superb now, it took them a long time to fix it. <laughs> yeah, it's funny that they, they've gone so far in that direction because on launch, weapons were nearly irrelevant. Yes, <laughs> they were just yeah. a damage number and they did nothing else. And uh, that was like one of my complaints about it was that, you know, I loved it, but um, it felt absurd to be a barbarian and just not care about what was in your hands. Mm. Just like, oh, whatever, just give me like some stick. Down <laughs> <laughs> if it says 300 after it, then that just means 300 and doesn't matter what the hell it is. There's a, an item, that, so there are set bonuses where if you wear two kind of green items or, or more, then it'll unlock uh, bonuses yeah. for, for having the entire set. And brilliantly, there's an item that lets you achieve set bonuses with like one fewer set item. <laughs> so you can just equip that in, into your brain or whatever, how you extract that from the item and put it in your brain. <laughs> then all sets you ever wear will just, you won't have to have as many set items, right. which lets you have more sets on your person. So I've got I like three or four crisscrossing sets, like my hat and my boots. Like, oh, right, because you can have you can have more sets than is possible. Exactly right, yeah. <laughs> so that's just the, the, the theory crafters have gone nuts on the forums. It's like, oh my god, we can do anything now. <laughs> we can have everything. I love this idea of like someone wearing like, I am wearing the complete set of Ragnar's armour and they just have no torso. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> the complete set. <laughs> think you'll find <laughs> so like I've got matching gloves and pants that gives me one set bonus and then I've got matching hat and feet and that gives me another one and uh, uh, so much fun do you think I there like... are law nerds who are really angry about this because it does seem sort of cheap <laughs> to say like, oh, you, you must find all the legendary artifacts eh, hey, you're close enough you've got most of them who cares about the lost sword I think um, Blizzard have succeeded in making the Diablo 3 laws so anodyne that, that <laughs> there, there are, are no, nerds. <laughs> no like you know buffs for Diablo 3 law. <laughs> uh, so there's no no one's really angered by that. Yeah. It's like cool new toys, basically. Uh, and that's what it's, what it's sort after of you've after you've internalised one of these uh, abilities, um, can you like switch them out freely? Yeah, I believe so. I'm not sure actually. I'll have to check that. It might you, cost I mean, money or so the Redrick Cube used to be a thing where you put things in and something comes out. Do you have to get in the cube to be yourself as a party? That's really poorly explained. <laughs> no idea how it actually functions. Why does it affect you? It's uh, no, it's weird. You, you can do other stuff like you can convert gems into other gems, which is just a useful quality of life thing. And uh, you can also upgrade. This is a good one. You can upgrade a rare item, a yellow item, into a gold item. And when it goes into a, becomes a gold version, it, it has a chance to roll those affixes that do crazy shit right. when it becomes legendary. And it's uh, that's a really good way of solving the kind of if you hit a problem where you, your gear's really good but you need one amulet, you just need a better amulet. Then you, well, now you can just bop it in the queue with some stuff and hike it up to legendary, and then you know go up to another difficulty level. Hmm. Play it all again. Do you remember in um, the Diablo Two expansion that I can't what it's called that Lord of Destruction maybe? Is that the ball one? Yeah, there was a wintry place. Uh, there was a special blacksmith there who would personalise one item. So just once in your whole character's playthrough. I guess probably if you went through it on a higher difficulty, you'd get it again. Hmm. But for me, just once, uh, they, you could pick one item and they would, I think, sort of re-enchant it. It gives some, gives some extra properties, but at the same time, it would be named, like, I, mine was a dagger or something, and it was renamed to Pentadax Dagger. And it came up in orange text, which they'd never used before at that point. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, that was really cool, because it was... I mean, I don't know if Diablo Systems supported it well enough at that time for that item to be useful forever, because I think items kind of got out of date in a way that they um, they don't in, say, Torchlight, where you can keep on enchanting the same thing yeah. kind of forever. Yeah. Um, but it you know, gave you one more thing on your character that was just, I made this one choice one time, and it's just to have this permanent effect, and now forever I'm... My special item is the dagger, and if you, even if you have a another necromancer, which I think was my class, um, even if you picked the same skills as me and developed it in the same way, you'd probably have a different item that you enchanted, because apart from anything, the items are random, so even if mm. you wanted to, you couldn't have the same item as me. And, yeah, I really like that. Yeah, the, there is an enchantress, 
and she, you can re-roll individual stats on weapons, uh, which is a way to keep them useful to you. Uh, but sadly, you can't, you can't make a name things up to you. Hmm. But maybe that'll come in the next expansion. <laughs> which do you think, are they, do you think they are going to just continuously expand this then? Uh, the, well, they were hiring, there was a hiring notice for, uh, a Diablo project. So yeah. there's definitely something going on. And uh, there was a, there's a leaked kind of roadmap for Blizzard, uh, a while back, which, uh, featured two Diablo expansions. <laughs> they're, uh, they're a bit late. So, um, yeah, I, I would expect them to do another Diablo thing. And I'm d- delighted if they just keep on expanding it really. <laughs> it's interesting if it's, it's still successful for them. Like, it's just hard to see. I don't, don't know what, whether we have any visibility into their audience size or no, anything no. like that. No, uh, no, it's very hard to tell. And but they, they, they've released several free updates, and the latest one it added new monsters and stuff. It added a whole hmm. a big new zone, and all of that stuff is great because it feeds back into it, uh, into the rifts, Nephilim rifts, which completely randomise the level and then randomise the monster makeup in that level, huh. so that uh, things that shouldn't live together do <laughs> with often horrifying uh, consequences. <laughs> so in their new because uh, it can kind of randomly turn a mob into a superhero mob that is like really super hard and they're, they're, they become enormous and they glow yellow uh, it's very hard to miss them <laughs> so the, the new one of the new enemy types they've added in the Rooms of Seshron is a giant bloated rat monster and uh, when it's threatened it's, it's covered in these postules and it kind of squidges itself and uh, loads of rats small <laughs> rats explode from the postules or inside it oh, okay. and then charge you <laughs> but what can happen is that you can run into like an elite version of these things that are massive they glow yellow and then they shit out rats that are also glowing yellow and also massive <laughs> and it just it becomes absurd and if, if they're then paired with the, the charging balls from Act 2 then you just get these absurd like combinations of like b- balls charging at you rats shitting out other rats and they're attacking you and then you, you call in a meteor because that's a good solution to, <laughs> to that kind of problem and uh, yeah it's great I love it I love it I, I know it's a kind of Part of me knows it's just cow clicker with, with exciting mm-hmm. clicking, but at the same time, can't help can't help it. I think I own it. I think I should probably get back into it just to see. It's nice and quick. Would you take me through it now? Is yeah, yeah, yeah. It? I've got loads of. I'd, I'd always roll an odds or something. All right, and blitz through. Yeah. Tom, what have you been playing? I'm still playing Metal Gear Solid. Yay! Hey! Okay. Can't stop me or make me play anything else. <laughs> it's a good game, isn't it? It's, yeah, it's, yeah it's, it's awesome. And there's just so fucking much of it. You can just play it forever and just never get through it. Like it's, I don't think I've ever played anything like this that's, uh, that kind of lasts so long. Like in terms of amount of stuff, mm-hmm. it's more comparable to Skyrim or um, something like that. But... It doesn't feel like Skyrim because it's a game that the primary reason I play it is because it feels really good and <coughs> I enjoy the stealth mechanics and stuff and just having that, um, but infinite of it seemingly <laughs> is amazing. I think we talked about, um, sort of the, like, what it is before. Like last week we talked about loads of specific things that, uh, each of us particularly liked about it, but it's like two, big open worlds. Really, it could just be one and it would be more than enough. Um, like Far Cry Island or um, that kind of big open space full of little outposts. But instead of little outposts, they're more like... There are there are little like roadblock-type outposts, but then there's whole villages or whole compounds, and yeah. those are all very custom-designed. And it doesn't... I was trying to think, figure out why it doesn't feel the same as... Far Cry 3 and 4, because loads of the things that um, I like about it are, you know, raved endlessly on this podcast about how good Far Cry 3 and 4's outposts are and how much I enjoy just the, the, this sort of isolated stealth challenge in the middle of an open world and being able to approach it from any angle. It has all of that, but it's better than those. Uh, I think partly because they're just sort of... There's more to them, like an individual roadblock thing will be like an outpost, but then a proper village. They're big... And they're handcrafted, which is some of the outposts in Far Cry 3 and 4, but I think they're kind of, they're less template-y. You know, mm. each one is really, like, visually striking, and you, I can look at any one of them and tell you exactly which one it is. I can probably yeah. point to on a map at this point, uh, which is not true at all in any of the Far Cry games. I can look at any outpost and everything and tell you which one it was. Mm. Uh, Far Cry 4 had these, like, strongholds, which were, were a bigger outpost and, you know, more sort of designed, I think. Um, and those were visually unique, and some of them were really striking and cool. Um, but they were kind of... 
a different proposition in some ways. They were just like very high pressure, very kind of like some of them were literally fortresses, you know, just had massive castle walls uh, you had to scale and stuff. Um, and so there wasn't as much. It was really you, you just conquer it and then you're kind of done with it. Whereas Metal Gear Solid has the main missions. I'm on mission 18, and I'm probably more than 30 hours in. I think I'm probably like 40 hours, <laughs> and I haven't really been like dawdling intentionally. I've been doing side ops. Uh, but the side ops and the main ops are very similar. They're really, and in fact, just not doing either of them and just going into an outpost and just trying to kill some people mm-hmm. is very, very similar to the main ops and the, the side ops because they're all just do this objective at this particular place. And the guards you encounter will be the same guards you'd encounter, well, to some extent, um, the same guards you'd encounter if you just walked there anyway without being told to. Um, and the objective wouldn't be there if you didn't take on the mission. But um, it's sort of, I can almost imagine people criticizing it for this. I haven't seen if they have, but um, it's the missions are kind of generic. Like they are, go to this place and either it's almost always extract someone. Sometimes it's get some a particular blueprint or intel or something, but most of the time it's extract someone. Sometimes it's extract five people. Sometimes it's extract a tank. <laughs> um, but they're very similar, and there there is some scripting in the missions, but very little of it. And that's why I like it so much, is because. That, you know, that's the biggest difference between this and Far Cry 3 and 4, is Far Cry 3 and 4, every time I've raved about them, I've probably ended that rant with, uh, oh, but the missions are absolute bullshit. <laughs> and mm. As soon as there's any kind of story and any kind of, like, main mission thing, it's always a pain in the ass, because they want to do a special scripted sequence. And Metal Gear, it does have those, and it has, it has two things. One is bullshit. <laughs> every now and then, there's some bullshit. The intro is bullshit, and then I think four... Other missions since then, of the 18 I've played, have some form of bullshit in them. Usually it's, you have a really good mission, and then the last five minutes there's only say, bullshit time! <laughs> and all the rules change, and yeah. you're just fucked over for the reasons you couldn't have foreseen. And that sucks, but it's very small amount of actual time. Yeah. Um, and then they have another kind of scripting, which is come up less often, and is, uh, there's a mission where, um, I won't spoil any plot stuff, uh, but you have to... There's someone who's going to go around and interview a bunch of prisoners, and your right. objective is to extract one of those prisoners, but you don't know which one it is. And you won't know until you um, uh, identify him. And also, the guy who's going around and interviewing them is an interpreter for Afrikaans, the language, and you don't have an interpreter for Afrikaans, so it'd be really good if you'd extract him as well, because you'd like him to work for you. Anyone you extract is automatically on your side. <laughs> we won't go into why. Um... <laughs> And so the mission parameters, the way they... Like, you have this voice in your ear telling you how to do the mission. And this looked... Had all the hall signs... Hall, hall signs? Hallmarks or <laughs> signs of um, a bullshit mission. It was like, oh, God, it's scripted. There's a patrol. You've got to, like, tail the interpreter because you don't know where the prisons are. So you've got to follow him. And it's like, ah, oh, Assassin's Creed. No. <laughs> I don't want to stay within the radius and then get failed for going too close and then failed for going too far. Um, but... The more you experiment with it, the more you realize that there aren't any... I don't think there are any bullshit fail conditions in the whole mission. There's no way to fail the mission except by killing the guy you're meant to extract. I think that's literally the only way you can fail it is if he dies or if you die, uh, which is completely fair enough. I think that's about um, both those situations I would agree that I'd failed. (laughs) And so the prisoner exists out there. There's four of them. Um, I think it's four. And this guy's going to interview all of them, and he will do so on a real schedule... Um, and separately from uh, from the mission parameters, you can also find extra intel on what's going to happen. So there's a bit of intel that tells you what time of day the real target is going to be interviewed. You still don't know which one he is, but you know what, what time the interpreter will uh, visit him. Mm. And they will pick up, the, like other people will carry the, like, uh, load the prisoners into vehicles and drive them from the location where they're being stored to the interview room for the interpreter to interview them. And all of this is just going on all the time. And it is scripted in the sort of sense that, you know, a script was written to make this work. But it's also properly interactive. You can interrupt it at any time. I realized really early on, just the route I'd taken to the mission point, it crossed by a road. And the first time I did it, I noticed uh, just as I arrived at the road, there's a jeep driving around the distance. And I had my dog with me, and the dog can detect um, people and kind of tag them, even if you haven't tagged them with binoculars. And he tagged that there was a prisoner in the jeep. <laughs> I was like, oh. So I just reloaded the checkpoint and then just sprinted to the road as fast as I could and got there before the jeep and then just shot at the jeep so it stopped huh. and then killed the guy who got out and then just rescued the... I didn't even um, 
take the prisoner out of the jeep. I just attached a balloon to the jeep itself. <laughs> the jeep and the prisoner were lifted out. And that could have been the target. It wasn't. But, um, you know, there's a, uh, I think it's randomized which one is the target each time. So that could have been the objective of the mission. The whole thing could have been just huh. done and dusted right then and there. Uh, but you can also, I was really, because I expected it to be bullshit, I was, um, uh, very tentative about what I did and didn't do. So I'd follow this interpreter for ages. I spent like 40 minutes on my first try mission and fucked it up. <laughs> but um, I didn't want to extract him because it kept telling you, like, oh, the, the way you're supposed to do this mission is follow the interpreter, and then when he gets to the prisoner, um, you know, ID all the prisoners he talks to, and then you will find the, the right guy once you ID that, that prisoner. And uh, But I really, really wanted this interpreter, and I was terrified he was going to get killed or something because... Without the interpreter, I can't interrogate any of the guards in this whole region. I was in a new map, and uh, all of them speak Afrikaans, and I don't, no one on my base does, so I can't interrogate them, so I can't do things like ask them where my objective is, or ask them where the other enemies are. Um, and so I was kind of more interested in the side objective than I was in the main one. And eventually, um, I just knocked out the interpreter, <laughs> and you get a message from your boss saying, what are you doing? We need the interpreter, because you know, if the interpreter doesn't show up, they might just kill the prisoner. <laughs> and that's it sounds like, okay, mission over, I've got to start again. But actually, he's just telling you about a rule that, that is true. If they, huh. if the interview time happens and the interpreter doesn't make it, they will kill the prisoner. But that's not necessarily going to happen. If I go around and find all the individual prisoners, um, or if I get lucky and the first prisoner I find happens to be the right one, then it doesn't matter. And, uh, yeah, then I extracted the interpreter ahead of time because I just didn't want him to die. And then it turns out there's another way to identify which prisoner is going to be the... Um, hmm. Uh, the real target and get him out there. So, incredibly, the scripting doesn't ruin it. It actually has. I, f- I found a few. Mi- well, I, f- I found one mission where it was similarly complex in terms of the various variables, but it definitely cooked the books in order to make you try and play it in one particular way. <laughs> yeah. It's, uh. I don't think it spoils anything to say this, actually, just to describe the mission. It's not, not particularly dramatic mission, but there's uh, a large building, there's a whole bunch of prisoners in it which are optional, you can rescue them and they're going to be shot unless you rescue them but there's also a prisoner who is the main target who's in a jeep, and he gets driven out with a, uh, a like a, a tank convoy behind him uh, but it triggers, when he drives out, when he gets driven out rather um, if he's driving out you wouldn't need to rescue him <laughs> um, it changes depending on where you are so the first time I tried to do it, I tried to go into the into the base. Then I was like, "Oh, I should probably you know look where see where these prisoners are getting shot at." Because you can hear the gunfire, and it sort of starts saying, "Prisoner died," oh, yeah. and your heroism decreases. Is this in like a ruined building? Yes. Yeah. 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 But uh, then then I heard the sound of the jeep, and the jeep fucks off. And I was like, "Oh, duh, do duh." <laughs> so I, I quit out. I was like, "I'm going to do this properly this time." So I got you know D horse, and we uh, we. Uh, trotted over to the road on which he uh, he escapes, which is the far side of the this, this complex to you. And uh, my plan was to shit on the road, um, <laughs> <laughs> which is D-Horse's special ability, um, which causes jeeps to skid and all of their occupants to mysteriously lose consciousness <laughs> for reasons which the game doesn't even bother to explain. Just the smell. Right? It's probably best it doesn't. Um, so that was my plan, and there were, there were some dudes on that road who I was going to, to take out. And um, But the thing is, as soon as you arrive there, if you go over a certain kind of distance away from the base along that road, the jeep instantly starts moving out of the base, huh. regardless of how, how long. It takes quite a long while if you're in the base. Right. But um, So uh, I failed it a couple of times. I was like, fuck this, I'm not going to give in. I'm going to do it my way, <laughs> <laughs> even though the game doesn't want me to do it. I'm going to show the game. Uh, so I ran over there, really expedited having a dump, and um, then laid loads of C4 on the road to blow up the tank. Uh, didn't manage to take out the two guards who were wandering along the road, but it was fine because they were they were too confused and they couldn't see me because there was an exploding tank in the way, then I shot them and that was fine. Um, but what was weird about that is, even though I did it fine, got the main prisoner out, I decided I couldn't be bothered going back into the base at that point. And so I just left the mission area. But it never told me that any of the people had been shot. I never lost any heroism for it either. Huh. So, like, but by not going into the base, I saved all those people <laughs> <laughs> somehow. I I had different results on that mission too. When I like the first time I played it, the prisoner died, and then hmm. I didn't restart. I searched the building for ages looking for the prisoner's body, so the next time I would know where that prisoner is, so I'd get them quicker. And I never found it. So then I did restart, and then I 
I think I found, I rescued the same number of prisoners, but that mysterious extra one never died oh. when I was in that building. There are some things that are randomised each time. How did you get the guy in the jeep? Um, I think I just followed him later. I think I spent ages in that building and then just kind of... They take him to another to place wherever he goes. quite far north and then they just lock him up there. Oh, right. And then basically you have a second stealth mission to do when you go up there. And it's probably a bit mm. harder than if you rush straight to him. Yeah, there's, there's, there are a lot of really good degrees of kind of fallback failure states that you get into in, in those missions. There's one where uh, they were again bundling a prisoner into a jeep <laughs> on the other side of the bridge. And it was at night and they were going to take him somewhere and probably torture and kill him. And uh, the guy on the radio was like, uh, Snake, you should follow that vehicle to get find out where they're taking him. And I was like, no, I'm not going to do that. And I, <laughs> so I, I legged it Shut Kaz. down into the valley uh, under the bridge and then climbed up the other side of the valley. And then as they were, you know, bundling him into the car, I smoke grenaded it. Then I ran into the smoke and fought them all, <laughs> knocked them all out. And uh, then... Like, went up to the prisoner and just extracted him. <laughs> and, Snake, and he was like, Snake, what are you doing? You need that guy to find out where the thing is. Uh, but then a cutscene happened, like a, a proper cutscene that was like a- acted and everything, where Snake finds out the guy's mute and the guy points through a mountain and you're, uh, and it marks a point like one and a half kilometres away on your map. <laughs> and that's how it resolves that. I kind of <laughs> failure state. I was like, yep, yeah, fair play. Thanks for actually just let, like, so many, so many other g- games would just fail you, fail you at that point. Yeah. Like, well, you didn't do it. Correct. Correct. Uh, I'm completely happy for them to have a completely contrived way of still giving me the information yeah. and just letting me do what I want. Oh, like, yeah, sometimes absolutely. there's just an Intel record somewhere mm. and you just, when you find the Intel, that tells you what the person could have told you. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I was, I was slightly annoyed that, uh, that mission played out differently depending on different trigger states that I engaged. Mm. But actually, and, that that is a far more preferable situation to the, how any other game would have handled it, which would just be you're leaving the mission area, yeah, yeah. yeah. or something like that. Yeah. The um, last week I complained that, well, mildly complained that, like I thought it was a little bit of a shame that every time there's an objective, even if your objective is to kill them or destroy the tank or whatever, <laughs> it's always better to falter it. Like that's mm. if you can, then you, that that eliminates it and you get the stuff. Yeah. And it's harder, but it's just it sort of means that actually sniping. And a target, an assassination target, is always a mistake. You're always wrong for doing that. Um, and since then, I've had a mission where they specifically say, your objective is to kill these five people. You've got to kill these five yeah. people. Yeah. And I thought, yeah, you don't mean that. I'm going to extract them anyway, because I know that's going to be better. Like, whoever I'm hired to kill, they're always going to be amazing. They mm. always are. You look through the Thunberg Bokris, and they're fucking off the charts. I can't <laughs> even tell how good they are, because they're so good. <laughs> and so it's always worth extracting them. And so it was, just, it was just one guy at this camp, like um, the first one I went to, and it was a really tough one. And I snuck through it. It was broad daylight because I'd mistimed my arrival, <laughs> and it was really difficult. I got all the way to the guy. I screwed up a little bit. Like, they, they were... I can't remember what they were alerted by. Oh, yeah, I threw a decoy to distract some people because they were going to see me. And so there was an inflatable snake standing there saying, <laughs> uh, kept you waiting, huh? And uh, wobbling around. And... Uh, so they were kind of on, on alert, but they didn't really know for sure if anyone was there. And, you know, it could have been rats who placed that decoy. <laughs> uh, I Eventually, I just, like, trank a few other people, but I got to the target, I tranked him, and it was inside a building. So then I had to kind of wait for patrols to go away before I could take him outside the building to Fulton him. And, uh, like, when I tranked him, my uh, contact reminded me, like, the mission was to kill him. Tranking him doesn't count, you know. <laughs> uh, and then I still went to great lengths to get him out of the building, then Fulton him, and they said... Well, the mission was to kill him, but okay, we'll go along with this, I guess, boss. <laughs> <laughs> and so I think that was the game trying its best to say, look, you really should just kill this guy. Yeah, I think at some points, I, I think it's different for everybody, but like, there's a huge pressure upon me to kill people now at the point I'm in the game, because um, my R&D department is still front rubbish. Hmm. Uh, it hasn't, uh, I haven't been able to research the Fulton that allow me to take tanks away, for example, and now the game's throwing tanks at me quite a lot. I have no real no choice but to blow them up. Which is, and up until that point, I, I think I'd only uh, killed people unintentionally. Um, so <laughs> it was it was kind of annoying that 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 was foist, foisted upon me. But actually, it's made the game a lot more fun. Mm. Um, I felt like I was running out of ways to play it uh, at a certain point because I was being so rigorous in being a undetected and uh, being non-lethal that uh, I'd actually made it kind of gruelling and unpleasant for myself because I'm an idiot. <laughs> and now, having been forced to kill a whole bunch of dudes, um, I'm kind of okay with it. <laughs> yeah. I'd just be desensitised, basically. Thanks for forcing me to murder. Yeah, yeah. It was the right thing to do. It was the right thing. It's so much more fun. 
You know, it's <laughs> very depending on mood for me. Like, there's a brilliant feeling in that game. Like, that game just feels feels amazing. The, it's the first Metal Gear where the kind of game feel of actually shooting a gun, mm. uh, of, of running, of, of, you know, dropping off things and making things blow up actually feels great. And I love being a kind of a, on horseback with a, a rocket launcher hunting tanks. Feels, it feels amazing. Yeah. You feel like this rogue Afghan warrior just kind of in the wilderness hunting tanks with this shoulder mounted RPG. And, uh, the, the way you can just kind of, you know, they're, they're trying to turn and shoot you, but your horse is just too agile and you're too, you're too awesome. So you just, you dodge the tank fire and blow them up with, uh, with your rockets. And it, it feels like a superhero moment in, in a stealth game, you know, which is <laughs> crazy. I think a lot of the, the feel of it, I mean, I'd love to, um, uh, interview the guy who's in charge of the direction of animation in that game mm. because, not only is it very good uh, in terms of just like technically the, the way the models are rigged is particularly good. Robert Yang was complimenting the game on its armpits, <laughs> uh, which is it's just you know they are duly very impressive armpits. Yeah. Like the you know when you raise your arm, it's not just a flat surface. They're kind of you can see the various tendons in there, and there's a hollow in the center. And, mm. and games don't usually have articulate enough models to represent you know an under underarm muscular structure. Fanta Pain does, um, but also. Uh, yeah, I think there's a very interesting article we've written about the difference in, uh, maybe it's, maybe it's a cultural difference between Japan and, and the West in terms of the way they approach animation. And I think, uh, it comes, I'd, I'd say there's a through line from, uh, like Capcom's fighting games, which were obviously, you know, used to be pixel art frame animated games to, uh, to the Phantom Pain, uh, a 3D game, which has not, occurred in, in, in Western game development. So when, for example, to take an example, like when um, Snake drops out of a helicopter, <coughs> it feels way faster than gravity. Mm. It's really impactful. It's very digital. Like he's he's on the edge of the helicopter and then suddenly, thump, he's on yeah. the ground. And he lingers in a kind of crouch pose for a few seconds. And it's kind of like it has anime influence. Yeah. Like, you know, where like th- there's often a, a frame of impact which is lingered upon in, in anime mm. for a long period of time. And, uh, I think that's, that's true of fighting games as well, which would, you know, obviously animation, in general frame animation breaks, like, bone structure in order to accentuate body movement and things like that. Yeah. Um, and that's certainly very, very true of fighting games, where you have extremely digital animation, somebody's, you know, got their fists up, and then the next frame of animation will be their arm, arm outreached, because it means, needs to feel that instantaneous and reactive. And it's very rare to see that in a 3D game because it's it's kind of harder to fake that with meshes uh, than it is with like pixel art frame animation. Yeah. Um, but they've really done it. Like you can see it in the swiping animations as well. It's whooshing, and it's you know the hand flips across and then this thing flies off, and it just all feels almost kind of caricaturish and cartoonish, yeah. but also at the same time extremely reactive in a way which is super gratifying. The the, the melee combo you do by like mashing, I'm mm. completely addicted to it. It feels <laughs> incredible every time you do it. I just do the throw every time because the throw is so decisive. That, that's also really. Like, decisive. You can do that yeah. just from scratch, like without any. You know, even if they're facing you, you can just run to them, just slam them on the ground with one move. <laughs> yeah, but I, I love, like, throwing smoke, and then they're just, like, they're flapping around. Then you just, like, do this insanely quick combo to the body, and then, as, as Marshall was saying, that completely instantaneous right hook <laughs> that, with the metal hand that uh, just knocks them out for ages. It just feels absolutely fantastic. I, my favourite thing to do is, um, uh, like I say, most of the objections are about capturing people, and sometimes that person you're trying to capture is really well guarded. And I had one mission to... Um, capture a guy who is just has four bodyguards at all times that just go everywhere with oh, him. Yeah. And I'm, I really like smoke grenades. It's one of the only games where I actually use smoke grenades. You know, they're in most tactical games and in most tactical games, I just don't know what they're for because I don't know whether it's good to be in the smoke or good to be out of the smoke. <laughs> like, do I throw it at the enemy or do I throw it at myself? Which one is good? Like, mm-hmm. and in Metal Gear, it just makes perfect sense because it's just, um, it's good to be in it and it's good for your enemies to be in it as well. You want, you've just, it's just like cover basically. Yeah. Um, and it probably works that way in other games too, but it's just here the mechanics are pronounced enough that it's clear to me what, when to use it. Mm. But if you throw a grenade in front of people, if you throw a grenade anywhere near people, they hear it land and they're very sensitive to grenades. They know what a grenade is. And when they <laughs> yeah. see a metal canister land near them, there's no kind of could have been rats. It's grenade! <laughs> <laughs> everyone runs. And even if you get them all, everyone else in the compound hears right. it as well. Yeah. And so the thing I've been experimenting with is, Kind of rolling grenades down hills. <laughs> oh, really? And just finding ways to get the grenade in front of them that involves not throwing it directly at them. Huh. Because it, it is, it's to do with the impact noise. And so I did one where I was just at the top of a camp and there's just one soldier there who's really good and everyone else was kind of a bit shit. So I threw the grenade at my feet on top of the cliff and let it roll down the cliff. 
uh, so that it just kind of trickled in front of them and uh, engulfed him in smoke. And I didn't even bother to go into the smoke uh, at first. I just stood on the cliff and just sniped everyone else who wasn't in the smoke, so that once I went in there and just, that, like noise was made, no one else would be alive to hear it. And that was really cool. And then the one with the four bodyguards, I was just hiding behind like a little shack that they were coming past on their patrol, and I just threw the smoke grenade at my feet, and it just rolled about three feet right out in front of them and just went... Tss. <laughs> as soon as it went, they all went, Whoa! but it wasn't a proper grenade alert because uh, they weren't, they didn't hear a grenade hit land. They were just like, something's happening. And then before they could say anything, they're all choked in black smoke. And mm. it has the same effect as uh, Deus Ex gas grenades where they're just kind of incapacitated by it as well as being uh, obfuscated. And then I ran in, slammed him on the ground. I did something really cool, which is I ran in, I just got straight to the guy I wanted, slammed him on the ground, picked him up and then ran out again. But I was videoing it at the time, and it doesn't look nearly as cool as it should have been, because uh, in the video I'm narrating, and you can hear what I'm trying to do, which is not at all what I did. <laughs> I, first I was trying to snipe him with the tranquilizer gun, and I was holding the wrong combination of keys, so I kept using my binoculars and kept like tagging him and re-tagging him. <laughs> and then when I finally got my gun up, I realised I can't see where the fuck he is because he's in smoke. <laughs> and then I forgot about my night vision goggles, or I, I think I'd learned not to use them at that point. Um, and then I ran in, and... Slammed him down. I didn't really mean to do. I was trying to sort of like grab him and then choke him out or something, but I forgot about the throw. But the throw worked great. Yeah. And then. The world's greatest soldier. <laughs> and then I picked him up, but I wasn't trying to pick him up. I was trying to fault him, but I pressed the wrong key. <laughs> so I thought, fuck it, let's just get him out of here right now. And that would have set off loads of alerts. It would have been a bad thing to do. Uh, and picking him up was the right thing to do, but you can hear me just say, no, no, fault him, damn it. <laughs> and then I run out of the body, having done the perfect thing, mm. but having sounded like a complete idiot trying to do it. <laughs> Maybe your, you know, the, uh, the in fiction explanation is your robot arm is malfunctioning. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm, I'm not playing as, um, as big punished boss Ahab snake. Oh, no, oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm playing as a, just a recruit who doesn't have a robot arm. Big punished boss Ahab snake. <laughs> those, all of those words are involved, yep. are in his name. He's also in, throw a, a naked. Venom. Venom, 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 mm. punished. Yeah, I've been doing some blog posts about Metal Gear, and every time I refer to him, he's a different combination. Of his <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's many names. I love using misdirection uh, to cover things like grenade throws. So whenever I see it, like a, anything that glows blue with a blue light on it, that means that's oh, yeah. a, a communication equipment that you can disrupt to stop people from calling in reinforcements. Which uh, I think once you destroy them, they stay destroyed as well in that region. Like they, oh, really? Yeah. So if mm. you injure their ability to call in reinforcements, like that, that you know, that network will be down for at least a while. Like a, a it, it's definitely true for anti-air, because mm. that determines where you can land, and yeah. so obviously you want that to be down next time you fly in, because that's the whole point of taking it out. I, I thought the communication equipment regenerated, I, don't, I might be wrong. There might be a time limit on it, because I've definitely had things where I've not blown up their communication equipment, but I've heard them on the radio say, uh, can't radio for support, All right. it's down. Uh, but I, I always plant uh, C4 on blue stuff, so that when I inevitably have to cause a fuss, <laughs> I can immediately proceed it by, by setting off the C4. And there's something incredibly satisfying about, you know, getting ready to throw a smoke grenade, uh, just before just like setting off a ex- distant explosion. And all the guards just go, what's that? And start wandering towards <laughs> it. And then you strike. And the rest of the guards are just distracted with the explosion. The, the, then there's a very local kind of alert where, you know, people who actually see the grenade will notice you and could be alerted, but then you can just kill them all. And, uh, no one will ever know. It's not, uh, your sniper's good for that as well. What's no quiet. Point. Yeah, right. you can point to like a, a a guy over there and you know just kill him, uh, order it to kill him, and they'll all go towards her location. And then yeah, do whatever you want. Best game. I, there's a load of systems that, that are in other games, but they're just done a bit better here. And mm. one of them is radioing and communication between guards and how it handles that. And it's a very common situation that someone who's seen you or someone who knows you're there but hasn't isn't quite directly engaging will want to radio their friends. And yeah. They start to do that. And I've never taken out the equipment because it makes too much noise mm. um, to do it with explosives. And um, so I'm often in a situation where they're just about to radio. They've already said, CP, CP, come in. And then CP replies, to say, this is CP, what do you want? And then just as they're about to say that there's an intruder, I shoot them in the head. Mm. And so the CP just hears the kind of like... <laughs> 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 and then there's a, there's a special message for like when they... They don't get a reply to their initial no way. response, yeah, and they say, great. "What? What's wrong? What's wrong?" <laughs> and then they don't send any. Re- it's been play tested to fuck that game yeah. in a way which yeah. is just incredibly phenomenal. Hmm. Uh, just there's so many little ways in which things react to you and your your little quirks. Oh, yeah. Fantastic. Just quickly on the animation, there's mm-hmm. one particular thing I really love, which is when you're prone. Obviously, you can still aim freely in any direction. Um, 
and if you're prone and then you try and aim behind you, you roll onto your back and you're lying on your back just holding your weapon above you, and it looks so fucking cool. Mm-hmm. Like that's If you're usually diving for cover or, you know, hurriedly going prone at least, and then someone comes around the corner and you just sort of twist around so you're lying on your back just ready to shoot them in the head just as they come around the corner, it looks so good. <laughs> shall we do questions? Yes! Then I shall read the questions. Um, Lachlan, let's pronounce it that way, mm-hmm. writes, Hello... Krach and Crate, which I guess is Crate and Crowbar in some other language. That's a Witcher 3 reference to... Oh, okay. There's a character of Krach and Crate. Ah, uh, this makes sense, because mm-hmm. this question is, um, I am delaying playing um, MGS 5 because I want to finish The Witcher 3 first. I like to really spend time in an RPG and explore all the little mechanics. I'm 80 plus hours in and loving it. So my question is, have you fine fellows finished The Witcher 3, and can you start a deep RPG like The Witcher 3, MGS 5, Batman, yada yada, uh, before finishing the one before it. Love the podcast. Cheers. Um, I certainly can move on from an RPG without finishing it. Yeah. <laughs> because it's what I do almost every time. <laughs> like we were talking earlier about uh, whether we'll even finish Metal Gear Solid. Yeah. <laughs> Why is we all loving it? Because it's fucking huge. And yeah, most games exceed my um, ability to finish them. I think, like, what's the last... Big open world RPG way. Well, Witcher we probably competed it. Oh, where we competed? Oh, oh yeah. Mm. I, I reviewed it, so I had to complete right. it. Um, would I have done otherwise? <laughs> good question. I, I read a good article, uh, which I think Graham linked to in the RPS Sunday papers this week uh, about uh, this guy talking about the idea of the mono game, mm. the, the game that has so much in it. And so many varied tasks, and it's, it's so long that it's the only game that you'll ever need. <laughs> and uh, you just play that forever, and you're constantly engaged with that one product. And then maybe in three years they release another product, and then you, you have familiarity with the brand and go, go on to the next mono game. And we've seen games like The Witcher Three, which is not only an RPG with combat and, and chat and all that RPG stuff. It's also a card game, and also a crafting game, and a, a gathering game, and is is everything. And then PS Five is like that as well. And it's kind of good, because I guess you're getting value for money in a sense, but uh, there's only so much life <laughs> you have. There's only so much life you can dedicate to, to one game. So it's, it's a, you know, it's, mm. it's, I, I feel more excited about games when I'm playing lots of different types of games and flitting between different types of games. And there are rare examples like Diablo that keep pulling me back in, but I, I'm much happier when I'm playing an hour of one thing and then an hour of another thing and then, you know, yeah. varying the experience up. It's quite a particular kind I think that you talking about. Things like Witcher 3 and, Me- and Metal Gear are uh, two things that are open worldy and have lots of different things to do, but also the main quest thing is massive in mm. itself. Whereas yeah. something like Skyrim, the main quest is like eight to ten hours. It's not a huge deal. Yeah. It's sort of the length of a of a decent length game. Uh, and then the game itself is still a massive several hundred hours thing. And so Elder Scrolls games I'll probably always complete them. Like mm. I always book, do the main quest. I'm just I know like the main quest is rarely the best bit, but I'm always interested to see what they do with it and just um Hmm. Uh, go through it but that's not a massive investment really there. that's not really anything like it's not even completing 50% of the game I had a something that makes me wonder about you know the ability to sort of stick with one game or move on to other ones is um, I had a dream about the new Deus Ex recently what? <laughs> where, so my dream was <laughs> this is uh, kind of lame but um, the PC Gamer had review code for Deus Ex Mankind Divided and they wanted me back for one last job to review the new Deus Ex because obviously I'm the only person in the world who could possibly do this I thought I was out they pulled me back in I could probably with their it. mechanical arms but for some reason I was already playing the code that they had I don't know how I got hold of it but I was playing it and it was fucking great but when on examination all of the elements of this game that I imagined was Deus Ex and Mankind Divided are straight from Metal Gear <laughs> they're all like uh, there was uh a helicopter. I was riding in the helicopter and chasing like a jeep thing, and but it was kind of like auto, on autopilot, just tracking it. Mm. And there were certain things I could do from the helicopter to like force all the people to get out of the jeep. And then there was these watchtowers that are exactly like Metal Gears and the stuff you could do with them. And I started to realise like I'm so all of these little sort of quirks of Metal Gear and these um, features of it that I'm interacting with all the time and stuff to do with the way you take people out and um, you know we were talking earlier about the close combat and the, the mm. throws and stuff. Uh, when I go back to Deus Ex, I have to remember that that takes up an energy cell. No, it's yeah, like yeah. a big deal. 
and it's not sort of fluidly integrated into the gameplay. It's a sort of separate cutscene that stops you, and and you get to watch that. And I love that in yeah. Human Revolution when I played it. But now, maybe now I'm not going to. Well, it's interesting. I think we were discussing with Chris how all PC gamers are going to have a very different appreciation of Batman uh, when it comes out on PC um, from all the people who played it on console pre pre. Uh, pre Metal Gear Solid. Because oh, they're, very, they're very different games, obviously. I mean, one, you know, Batman's more of a brawler, but hmm. just in, in terms of stealth in an open world, you know, I think probably the consensus will be that Batman pales in comparison hmm. to Metal Gear Solid. Yeah. Yeah. Though if you can't see it reviewing Deus Ex Mankind to Artists, <laughs> uh, maybe that could be a That's all I'm saying. Humes can come true. Um. Be hey. desperate for freelancers at the moment or something. <laughs> oh, offering jobs left, right, and anyone. <laughs> Must be desperate to be asking Tom. <laughs> <laughs> no. um, Kane writes, Podcast professionals! <laughs> Imagine a world in which video games have an academia that's big enough that it wouldn't fit inside a moderately roomy garage, <laughs> and that's well-funded enough that it doesn't have to. What P versus NP-esque hard problem of game development would you like to see solved by these numerous and well-funded researchers working together with the foremost figures in the field? I'm thinking of business, process, and presentation-related things, like how to share reusable assets uh, between unaffiliated studios, like what John Roberts talked about last week, and what From Software is maybe doing. More than difficult technical challenges, like procedural city generation. But I'll settle for either. Personally, mine would be figuring out how to get anybody in, in the industry to care about games writing as much as they care about literally everything else, <laughs> including the colour of LEDs on their development machines. <laughs> Aside from simple apathy, I can't help feeling that it's a process... That it's a process problem, that the industry just hasn't figured out how to fit that into a development cycle. Or, technology-wise, maybe a third-party character customization library that is as excellent as Saint Rose, and which everyone can just import into the game and not have to roll their own pale imitation. Regards. I think um, one thing I'd love there to be um, a sort of established way of doing is um, dynamic music the context reactive music. Hmm. It's like an amazing idea, but you never really see it done brilliantly. Oh, really? Do you not? I don't... I mean, there are games where it's sort of, it, it is doing it, but you just don't really notice it, at least for me. Um, but isn't that... That's quite good, isn't it? Where you, well, where so I've had moments where I often... Many games have racks I don't like, so I leave the music yeah. off on many games, and I often play my own music over the top of it. And every now and then... A good song syncs up to the action in this amazing way where there's just like the the break in the song matches up with a moment. I remember in Fear one time, um, uh, there's a song uh, by Destroyer that has a kind of uh, slightly meandering guitar intro. It sounds like they're just kind of jamming and messing around. And then the jamming stops for about five seconds and then the whole song comes in and the main riff is a lot like the thing they were jamming but a kind of perfected version of it but with full instrumentation. It really um, just sounds great. And... I was playing Fear, and I was sort of scouting out a room full of guards and figuring out how to attack, and then at the moment I attacked, that synced up with them finishing the jam part of the song, and in the total silence period was when I was launching into slow-mo and jumping over a table at the moment when everyone was just kind of realising I was there and doing like a scissor kick through the air, and then the moment the kick lands, all the instruments come in. Uh, <laughs> and it was just so fucking perfect. And if there's any way to do something like that. <laughs> also, um, have you ever seen that video of uh, Chris Remo playing the guitar while Nick Brecken plays Far Cry 2? Oh, yes. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, setting yeah, up yeah, an ambush. That's, that's and he does this tense, tense, yeah. tense, tense music all the time. He's setting up the ambush. And then as they start to approach, it gets builds in intensity. And Chris isn't like... Um, he doesn't have to react with the speed of a computer to hmm. make it match up. You know, so he's it's tense even before the ambush goes horribly wrong and it just gets more intense after it re- it's apparent it's gone wrong. So it doesn't require sort of prescience or anything. It's just yeah. reacting to, oh, lots of things happening, we should build up this layer. Yeah, there's, I mean, I, I think, but I think that stuff is there now. I like, I mean, actually Far Cry 2 has very good reactive music, although it doesn't, I think, I think the thing that's missing is anticipation because the game can only tell you what you're doing currently. It can't tell you what you're going to do, whereas yeah. a, a human person can see what you're doing. And in fact, that's actually the thing that I would... Uh, I would ideally like. I mean, there is a lot of uh, academic work that goes on in, in video games, or at least in ancillary systems to video games, like um, uh, AI, for example. There's obviously there's quite a large act- academic field involved in that, and uh, rendering and those those kind of graphic technologies. Obviously, there is a huge academic discipline involved. But um, I was thinking that uh, 
this is this is something I had a dream about actually <laughs> ages ago. But um, uh, I, I would like to see AI behaviours uh, essentially crowdsourced from the recorded uh, playthroughs of other players. <laughs> Um, I think you could do this in games which are... Uh, uh, so the, the game I imagine would be a sort of chase game where there's uh, y- you'd you'd be pursued by an, another another character, essentially, through a level, uh, through a series of levels. But I was thinking that at every point, uh, the game would be mixing and matching between um, playthroughs of actual real players who'd played it and their data had been uploaded to the cloud that were close enough to your current situation. With enough players, you could actually map out quite a large number of different circumstances and essentially tween between those circumstances. <laughs> and based on, you know, the, the the success that whichever player had in that circumstance of achieving whichever goal they, they had, I could con- can see that you could do something like that with cloud data and uh, and like some sort of AI blending. But obviously, that's that's probably a long way off, really. Yeah, awesome. <laughs> there is a game um, called uh, Hairs Other People by George Buckingham, yeah. which is a uh, like a top-down shoot 'em up, like a spaceship thing, where you're moving a spaceship around and pressing fire, and uh, there's I think there's multiple enemies, and they're firing back at you, and you've got to dodge their bullets and shoot them. Mm. But your own performance is being recorded and then is added to the enemy roster for other players. So every enemy you're fighting is actually how one player played the game. Oh, right. But it's, so, that can't react with you. No, it can't. It? You see, that's what that's what you're thinking. Like, I mean, you, would, you would, as a player, would be essentially triggering uh, a, a tactic used by somebody else. And it would, you know, depending on what difficulty level you'd set it, or how, how well you were doing it, it'd be like, well, what did the world's most successful player as the antagonist <laughs> in this game uh, do when uh, he, you know, killed somebody in this circumstance? What was his tactic then? And then yeah. just kind of... So the game itself sort of has to boil down to a discrete number of circumstances, isn't it? Like, yeah, I mean, you'd have you have to have... abstract it into that. Yeah, like the weapon, is, the player has pulled out a certain weapon in a certain position, and then you know how is, how should you deal with that? Perhaps, like, yeah, I, don't, how, I think you could do it in a, in a first-person shooter. I mean, it might not, uh, it might not work. <laughs> you you need a huge amount of data. That's the thing. But uh, these games do have huge amounts of mm. data now attached to them. How, how would it choose the AI response? Would it be a kind of Darwinian thing where these are the AIs that survived this particular situation yes, yeah, and then, yeah, yeah. then acts on that? But it, it, it might lead to a like prescient AI that's very, very hard because no mm. matter what you do, it responds perfectly. And it's actually, it's, it's quite easy to code AI that is perfect and will always be accurate and always shoot you in the head. And um, it's kind of advisable for, um, Sloppiness to be coded into behaviour in a way. Oh sure, but you could you could gauge it. I um, see, like a slider. Yeah, yeah. slide. How effective you want them. <laughs> <laughs> People who are you know successful seventy percent of the time, maybe or forty uh, percent of the time. Or... Yeah. <laughs> if you want, if you wanted lots of data, so say you've got these player player reactions recorded, and then you want lots of data on how effective is this, how much of the time does it succeed or fail, then you can run accelerated simulated tests like the way. Supreme Commander 2's AI was developed was as a neural network, which means that mm. it was uh, it would pick a thing to do, and then it would run that simulation. You know, for, for a given number of units or enemy strength, it sort of divided the enemy forces into blobs. It's the kind of abstraction I was talking about, where it had to say like that blob there, that's a platoon, and it's got the strength of this and a defense of this and yada yada. And then I'm going to try deploying this unit in this way. And then I look at how many units I have left, and look at how many units that they have left, and that's my score for how well that worked. Huh. And then I try something else, and it just did that thousands and thousands of times on, a, on an accelerated basis, and then figured out, you know, the best thing to do in response to each type of platoon. Right. So you can do stuff like that to kind of get data hmm. without humans. There was, uh, in fact, I think there was, a, 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 it might be a neural network, I don't know. Actually, but uh, well, it's, it's a similar learning system was uh, uh, involved in developing animation techniques. I think UCL was doing this, but uh, anyway, they'd, they'd have a, a a rig and uh, it, you know a, a, a person would be trying to move, and depending on how successfully it was judged to have done the thing, it would then kind of branch off and evolve various different versions of that and then it would pick the more successful versions of that mm. evolution and then keep them going and evolve and evolve and evolve until it uh, until it was successfully kind of moving by itself in a way which felt realistic and smooth. Mm. I'm sure that, that could be a, applicable in, in games in some way. I'm not sure how. Yeah. I'd like a kind of shared technology that generates good cities, like convincing cities that make sense as like districts and you know mm. different kinds. I, I think of uh introversion, subversion, they're abandoned kind of uh, as a project. Yeah. As part of that, they built, you know, 
a big advanced city generator. Yep, yeah, you can download it and, <laughs> and play around with it. And uh, it's kind of, but it feels like even though it is out there in that form, it's lost all that expertise gained procedurally generating cities is lost <laughs> into the ether. And, uh, and how many indie uh, projects have actually created technology that could be used in a wider sense, you know, across the industry, and actually to so, so, so all those poor people in uh, Ubisoft offices hand making Paris. <laughs> Uh, could actually just press a button and procedurally generate most of it and then go in afterwards with a paintbrush to kind of drop in the, the, the correct kind of historical monuments. I think, well, I think procedural generation is something that's being looked at at universities as yeah, well. I mean, yeah. we, we, uh, we're friends with Michael Cook, who hopefully yeah. will come on the podcast at some point. Oh, that'd be great. Uh, but he's a, you know, a pro- proc gen proc wizard. Yeah. And he's obviously doing proc jam, which is in November, which is a, a jam dedicated to procedural generation things. Is it, is, um, is it great? It's right. It's, it is one of the most exciting things about Mm. In games, procedural generation. The, the idea that you, like, with enough advancement, you could just procedurally generate levels like an invisible ink, that, you know, where those levels, they don't necessarily make sense, make sense as living spaces, but they're fun, really fun levels. They're really mm. fun places to, you know. Mm. Well, uh, what's the, uh, the name of that? Uh, I think it might have been abandoned now. Uh, is it Ultima? I've forgotten. It's some massive oh, yeah. MMO. Ultima Regium or something. N- no, can- no, no, not not that. Um, like uh, uh, a famous MMO brand has now released a tool which is uh, what, like EverQuest. A bo- voxel. Is it EverQuest? EverQuest the Next. It next, was called. Next. And uh, there's, yeah, there's, it's quite confusing. There's a few different kind of versions of it. Uh, the, what's the the name of the the tool that's uh, associated? Story with it? Bricks. No. It does use... <laughs> Although that might be something it does use. Yeah, it does <laughs> use I'm, I'm thinking in terms of the actual landscape itself, which is... Uh, I, I interviewed okay. the guy who uh, who is behind it. He was working for a long time, seeming off his own back, just developing procedural generation tools, and he was able to bring up, build, uh, like, a, you know, a grammar which would convincingly generate cathedrals. Mm. Uh, yeah. And, you know, fairly, uh, like, sophisticated pieces of architecture. I think his name is Miguel Separo or something like that. Mm. I don't know. I'll put it in the show. But... Um, Obviously, he's you know that that stuff exists. It's just uh, yeah, like you said. Obviously, it's been bought by the people who make EverQuest, so it's not inconceivable that uh, you know uh, uh, some kind of uh, AutoCAD would produce uh, like uh, a a, you know awesome. procedural generation tool that would be shared among other game developers. The, the new Speed Tree, yeah, yeah. Kane always mentions um, as examples business and process related things uh, on the business side. It would be great if someone could solve discovery. <laughs> if someone could mm. come up with a system by which oh, yeah. everyone who would like a game sees that game yeah, and is, yeah. is exposed to it in a way that will, you know, pique their interest. Because there's, like, even aside from my own selfish concerns and that I would like my games to do well if they're good, uh, it would just be good as a gamer to hear about loads of interesting things. Steam is trying, but it's, mm. uh, it's obviously a massively hard problem. And, um, my Steam queue is garbage, really. <laughs> it's, a, it's a combination of garbage and then wild cards that are interesting enough that make me think it could be really good because it suggests things I already know about and um, either have or don't care about. Uh, 95% of it is, because I use Game Maker a lot, it says, wouldn't you like to use FPS Maker? Wouldn't you like to use this paint package? Wouldn't you like to use this modeling mm-hmm. package? Wouldn't you like to make... Uh, an MMO, like an MMO creation tool it recommended to me. And they have terrible views. They're like, these are things people hate. It's rubbish. It's a piece of shit. I keep recommending to you because you just love tools so much that you must want to play tools all the time and never want to play a game again. But then when it does play a game, like, oh, I can't remember what it's called now, but there's a, like a side-on brawling sports game maybe involving a ball that I'd never heard of before and it has like a 99% positive rating on Steam. And I, it was actually in the IGF, and it got a load of votes, I think. Um, and, yeah, seemingly everyone who plays it absolutely loves it. And it's not quite my cup of tea, but I'm sure there are loads of things like that where it's just fucking brilliant, and I haven't mm. heard of it. Hmm. Next question. Rachel Nersha asks, Predictions for the 2020s. Which computer games will survive the Corbin's, will survive Corbin's glorious communist revolution? <laughs> well, Red Alert. <laughs> of course. Uh, I think Stalker is probably going to be a good chance. Oh, if, yes. Well, only if Russia annexes Ukraine, obviously. But um, I think uh, video games by then will be produced by the state and distributed <laughs> uh, based on need rather than at once. Uh, I look forward to that glorious future. <laughs> God, we're all fucked if any kind of societal change comes about where people's employment has to be in some way productive or helpful to society. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we're not right. helping anybody. <laughs> 
Games journalists are the first against the wall. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> That's where we should be. Um, Scoo asks, uh, as we stand on the apparently inevitable cusp of an Anders Brevik DLC, which atrocities are missing from gaming? This is an incredibly offensive but very funny email um, <laughs> relating to the uh, incredibly offensive and not very funny uh, Assassin's Creed DLC, which is the Jack the ah, Ripper DLC. Jack the Ripper, of mm. um, which is, uh, yeah, I don't know. I mean, uh, uh, yeah, I suppose Jack the Ripper has been used as a source of kind of schlocky entertainment for so many years. It does seem to be in a tradition that would uh, uh, it feels unfair to accept uh, Ubisoft uh, from the rest of that by by saying this is this is tasteless, but mm. I don't know. <laughs> it kind of is tasteless. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> tasteless. And just brevet would be is is it a case of just too soon? That would be hatred DLC, right? <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, 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 yeah. Suppose. But there's uh, enough distance that, as you say, it's it's okay to fictionalise it, which is kind of an interesting uh, moral problem. <laughs> Yeah, I think the, the problem with, I have with Jack the Ripper is that uh, the the best possible thing has already been done about Jack the Ripper, which, which is, is from Animals Hell. from Hell, yeah, 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 which is uh, obviously a, 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 a work of fiction, but it's also an incredibly clever and uh, articulate and sensitive that? work of fiction. Uh, Alan Moore's From Hell, the uh, the, the uh, Jack it, Noel. It also is, it's also kind of about how he's fictionalised mm. as well. Well, at the end, there's like a there's a second comic which yeah. is just about the history of the case and his investigation into it and the various different kinds of narratives that have propped up. Yeah, uh, and it's a, as comprehensive uh, an encapsulation of of the information, the actual facts surrounding the Jack the Ripper case has ever been presented and it's an incre- incre- incredibly learned work. It's extraordinarily um, well researched. Yeah. Like, he, yeah. It's, a, it's brilliant. And yeah, and so, you know, you've got a, in the trailer of uh, Assassin's Creed, you've got a guy with a bag over his face saying, catch me if you can. You're yeah. like, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah right, this this has off. been done a bit. <laughs> yeah. Oh, <Christ>. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I, uh, yeah, yeah. I think we can we can probably pass over the what atrocities would you like to see? <laughs> <laughs> mm. uh, Mental Penguin asks, "You are now in charge of a third Morrowind expansion. What do you make?" <laughs> I love how sort of arcane this question is. <laughs> like we're going way back now. <laughs> uh, so Morrowind was set in Vardenfell, uh, which was um, part of Morrowind, which is the home of the Dark Elves, and they did two expansions. One was Tribunal. Which was also in Morrowind, but said in like the capital of Morrowind, which was not on the island, it was on the mainland. I can't remember what it was called, Mournhold, I think. Um, and it was weird because it was just a city. It just did like the, all, the whole DLC just based in one big city. And it had some quite cool quests. There was one where you, like, you acted in a play and you had to memorize your lines ahead of time. And, and the reason you had to be there was because the player was going to be assassinated during the play. And so you had to be there to be like, to, uh, Kill the assassin when it happened, I guess. Um, and then there's Blood Moon, which was one way you were a werewolf and you're in some frozen place. Salt slime, I want to say. Um, and you could build towns? I did play it, but I guess I never got to the town building part, because I don't know how that factors in. This will, it sounds like a dream. <laughs> this, this, this experience yeah, is real. real. Right. Um, the one I'd like is uh, like a sort of prequel expansion, where it's set... In Vardenfell, but at the time that the Empire first, either, I actually don't know the history, but, um, at the time of Morrowind, the Empire is kind of almost occupying Vardenfell. They, they have imperial forts everywhere. Hmm. It's an elvish homeland, and they are, uh, the elves are kind of a very stodgy, right wing, um, slightly backward society who keeps slaves and stuff, and the Empire disapprove of it, but they haven't quite sort of crushed the Dark Elves. They're just kind of, Dark Elves can't get rid of them, and they've obviously got heavy military presence there, and the Empire's much bigger than the Dark Elves in general. And I really want to know more about how that came about, what it was like when they first started moving in there, and at what moment the Dark Elves realised, oh shit, we're just going to kind of let them be here. And It's really politically interesting. One of the few politically interesting... <laughs> There's probably be a guerrilla resistance kind of angle that you could... Uh, yeah. Hmm. Hmm. And that is all the questions we have time for. Can I just say, before we say anything else... Hmm. That the uh, very nice people who gave us our theme tune, who are the oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, a band uh, now reformed partially as Count Bobo, um, they have a new album out. And, oh, wow. uh, it's called Bird of Paradise, and you can get to it from countbobo.bandcamp.com. Huh. It is a rock steady in Scar six piece band from Bristol. If you like that sort of thing, and you should, if you like our theme tune, you should check it out. I bet you could use the uh, the piece of music. 
of theirs that we use as our theme tune as your helicopter music in Metal Gear Solid. Yes, <laughs> yes, we're going to do that when we play it in our... Well, hopefully Rich and I are going to play some uh, Metal Gear Solid for, and video it, yeah. and that is exactly uh, our plan. Brilliant. Oh, damn you. Brilliant. Um, but also, this new album does have a track on it called Bat Milk. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. That's, that's another reason to listen to it. You can send us questions at questions at creatingcrowbar.com. You can tweet them at us. We're at creatingcrowbar on Twitter. You can post them on our forum. It's creatingcrowbar.com slash forum. And you can follow us on Twitter individually. I'm at Pentadat, P-E-N-T-A-D-A-C-T. I'm at PCG Ludo, L-U-D-O. I'm at Marsh Davis, D-A-V-I-E-S. We've got loads of stuff on our YouTube channel. Probably doing more videos soon. Dark Souls 2 uh, videos are going up. Yes, I know. Going God, back well up. done, Tom. It's well done. finally <laughs> happened. So visit our YouTube channel and, and watch us be... Yeah, and we also have a Patreon as well, should you wish to give us some money for whatever we do. That is at patreon.com forward slash Crate and Cobalt. That's what it is. That's what it is, everybody.